the thing about chimps is you can keep them when they're young and then they get older and it's like a man. A chimp attack back in February ripped off part of a woman's face. His blood going into his room where he was shot. If the monkey moves away from your friend, let me know, okay? So we could try I to help your friend. No, no, I can't. She's dead. She's dead. Why, why are you saying that she's dead? She's dead. He ripped her apart. He ripped what apart? Her face? Everything. The true story of Travis the Chimp is a story I think about all too often. And as a clear message as to why chimpanzees, and other wild animals for that matter, should not be kept as pets. Now, you might have heard about that chimpanzee that mauled a woman's face off. Or if you've seen the film, nope, there's also a very similar event on there. And that is the story we're going to cover today, but there's so much more to it. Now, some elements of this video might be upsetting for some viewers, so you have been warned. This is going to be a longer video, and it is something I feel strongly about, so there is elements of my opinion involved, but I'll always give you the chance to skip ahead and stay on the Travis story, and I'll also look at both sides of the argument. Without further ado, let's get into this. First off, we do need to talk about the chimpanzee trade. In the last six years, over 14,000 chimpanzees have been lost to the illegal wildlife trade, with one chimpanzee being poached every four hours. You see, there's a huge demand for baby chimps, whether this be for pets or performers, or even used for experiments in labs. One baby chimpanzee can easily go for $10,000, but the capture of one baby chimp usually results in up to 10 adults being killed. This is because it's easier to capture the baby without resistance. So this poor baby is captured whilst its family members are slaughtered in the capture process. On what for? Also, we can look and laugh at the video of a chimp in a funny suit. Once a baby chimp is captured, it is then sold on the black market. The slaughtered adults are usually sold as bush meat. The Democratic Republic of Congo is both a main area of origin and transit country for the trafficking of great apes. As is the case with all poaching, the problem really lies with those people at the top who are pulling the strings and making serious money. Consumer demand is primarily driven from China, Russia and the Middle East. Although, unfortunately, chimps as pets and performers can be found all over the world. And there's certainly a market in the USA. In all these stories of pet chimps, it's usually the case that once the chimp grows beyond the infant stage, adult chimps are often locked up in cages, or even in a lot of cases killed, as they become harder to control. With Travis the Chimp, though, this wasn't the case. Travis was born in the USA by a chimp breeder in Missouri. His parents were Susie and Coco, who were both trafficked from Africa. Now, you can actually see this breeder on the Louis Threw documentary, America's Most Dangerous Pets. I highly recommend you watch this. It's quite a few years old, but it actually features Joe Exotic years before his Tiger King fame. It features a lot of people with exotic pets, and one couple has a pet chimp, and it smashes it through a window. Oh, and then, of course, the breeder of Travis the Chimp is interviewed. Louis asks her about Travis. She's this little old woman. To be honest, it's hard to hate her. What did you think about the whole Travis thing? Uh, Travis situation was a very uh, unusual and horrible thing to happen, you know? I don't know if she just got in too deep, but you can't breed chimps for sale. I do understand, however, a lot of people just aren't educated in the subject, and that's why I'm making this video. So, Travis was purchased by Sandra and Jerome Herald for 50,000 US dollars. He was taken from his mother at three days old, and they named the chimpanzee after Sandra's favourite singer, Travis Tritt. Sandra and Jerry had several businesses, which made them their fortune. These businesses included a tow operation and an auto body shop. After purchasing baby Travis, they took him back home to Stamford, Connecticut. They played with Travis, who began to understand their language. Sandy bottle fed him formula, burped him, put him down for naps in a crib. And within a few months, he was scooting. Then a few more months, he was walking on his arms and legs, his knuckles absorbing much of the weight. They even taught him how to use the toilet. They would join him in the bathtub. They brushed his teeth and later taught him to brush his own teeth. Sandy also bought him an extensive wardrobe and dressed him every morning 
in a variety of clothes. The Heralds also retrofitted their whole house to accommodate Travis, with a large caged room in the rear, which had a set of sliders that led to an outdoor enclosure. They installed a heavy, lockable metal door on their bedroom, and when Sandy and Jerry were home, Travis had the entire house at his disposal. The Heralds also laid a mattress on the floor of their bedroom, though most nights Travis slept in bed with them. Travis would accompany the couple to work. He became well known in the town and had also been known to greet police officers as they would encounter him when they were towing cars. Having grown up around people, he was very sociable. He even used to playfully wrestle with one of the neighbors, although he always knew when to stop. The neighbor stated, he listened better than my nephews. As we'll soon find out, this wasn't always the case. After all, he's a chimpanzee. No matter how well he's trained, how cute he looks, dressed up in his little clothes, how well he can brush his teeth, he's not a human, despite clearly being raised like one. Now, if you've ever seen Rise of the Planet of the Apes, all this might be strangely familiar. Although in the case of Caesar, he was going to be euthanized, if not taken in. Now, this film is heavily praised because of the CGI. Even today, I think it's some of the best CGI going. Yet, some films are still using real apes. And listen, I'm not trying to put Crystal the monkey out of work. I loved her in The Hangover. But like a lot of people, I just think these animals belong in the wild. I understand also, most movies don't have the CGI budget of the Planet of the Apes, but maybe people can avoid writing a chimp into their indie film. This isn't the only cinema story either. There's a documentary called Project Nim, which is about the life of a chimpanzee called Nim Chimpsky, who was the centre of a research project in the 1970s to determine whether a primate raised in close contact with humans would develop a limited language based on American Sign Language. But this film also doesn't have a happy ending. Chimps have been used in countless television programmes and movies since the 50s and circuses way before that. They're always younger as well, you will have noticed. This is because it's basically impossible to train and domesticate a chimp over the age of eight. Even Travis did some TV work, once appearing in a Coca-Cola commercial. As of right now, there's no working chimps in Hollywood, at least. Steve Martin's work in wildlife, which supplied animals for movies, dumped the last working chimpanzees in a sanctuary. These chimps were Eli and Susie. I think most people have become wise to seeing chimps in movies, so hopefully that's it now. For Hollywood, anyway. There's plenty of chimps used in foreign films, Actually, a couple of my favourite foreign films of the past few years have featured real-life chimps in them. It might seem hypocritical of me to enjoy that film, but you can't help enjoying something that doesn't mean I support that element of it. I mean, ideally they're phased out of entertainment anywhere. I constantly see celebrities, for example, at Myrtle Beach Safari, which have loads of chimps dressed in outfits and all kind of animals used for entertainment. Like you can take a photo with a baby tiger and stuff. Now, I'm not trying to attack a place here, but they were featured in Tiger King as well. And I mean, the evidence of cruelty stacked up against them is pretty big. It feels like the world has forgotten this. Because one could argue that chimps in zoos or even used in movies, not that I agree, but someone could say, well, they're treated nice, it's a better life than them being poached. But at Myrtle Beach Safari, it seems pretty clear that they're not being treated that nice. I mean, the owner who was on Tiger King, Doc Antle, was riding an elephant. You don't do that if you know anything about animals. And he was actually charged with animal cruelty in Virginia. And then in 2022, the FBI arrested Antle, who was later indicted on 10 federal charges, six of which included wildlife crimes involving cheetahs, chimpanzees, and red rough lemurs. Seems pretty clear He's a wildlife trafficker. Now, to be fair, I don't know if he's still on board. I assume he's not, but to me, it doesn't look like much has changed at Myrtle Beach. There or anywhere else, you can take pictures with baby chimps, only care about the money. Those tigers you take pictures with in Thailand, they're drugged, and so are the cobras in Marrakesh. The guy in the street charging you to take a picture of his chained up monkey doesn't care about the monkey. SeaWorld getting orcas to do tricks. It's all the same. The animals, not photo props. But whatever looks cool on TikTok, right? It is worth noting though, however, there are some reputable sanctuaries. The reality is a lot of these working chimps couldn't go back into the wild. A chimp that's been raised as a human wouldn't know how to properly be a chimp. 
so a sanctuary or a zoo for rescues becomes the only place. Even Petter agrees with this, and it is a fact. There is also chimps that get fostered by people, and some sanctuaries do to support themselves, charge a fee, which makes them a zoo, but in a lot of cases they don't have another choice. Of course there is the argument of conservation, which because of how many chimps are currently getting killed and poached in the wild, it does technically mean that a safer alternative would be a zoo, albeit not natural, but we can't deny a lot of animals are getting poached. I do understand all this, but the long term solution however, is still as I said, phasing chimps out as pets, entertainment and I guess all of it. The more restrictions around the world, the less of a chimp trade and black market there's going to be. This is a pretty complex issue after all, but that doesn't change my mind about Myrtle Beach Safari. Dark ankle. So back to Travis. As Travis grew older, he got smarter and smarter. He could open doors using the keys, he watched television, rode a bike, watered the plants, he dressed himself, he would feed his owner's horses, he would eat at the table, he would go and get ice cream from the ice cream truck. But the craziest of all, on multiple occasions, he was known to get behind the wheel and drive a car. You see, the Herald's only child died in a car crash, so Travis was almost like their surrogate child. They also overfed Travis, so he became pretty much obese. In 2003 was Travis's first documented incident. He escaped out of the Herald's car and was on the loose for several hours, holding up the traffic at a busy intersection. Apparently what happened is some pedestrian thought it would be funny to throw an empty soda bottle into the window of the Herald's car and it struck Travis. So he unbuckled his seatbelt, opened the car door and chased the man down the street. Now, he didn't catch him. When the police arrived, he would have them running around their own car, like a Benny Hill episode. Around this time, Travis began having fits of erratic behaviour. This, of course, was because he was getting older and was now a fully sexualised adult. Like, adult chimps in the wild sometimes have sex up to 50 times a day. Chimps also stop being these cute, cuddly creatures and turn into this. Travis was around £200 at the time of this incident, and the laws in Connecticut on owning exotic pets actually changed. However, this didn't apply to Travis, because they didn't see him as a threat. After this, however, the Herald stopped taking Travis out in public. Not long after this incident, Jerome was diagnosed with cancer. Whilst in hospital, Travis was disorientated by Jerome's absence. Sandra put Travis on the phone with Jerome, but he would get too upset. He would even take pictures of Jerry off the wall and hold them close to his chest. On April 12, 2004, Jerome Harold died, just leaving Sandra and Travis. Before his death, he urged Sandra to put Travis in a sanctuary, which she did not, adamant that she could handle him all by herself. Now, there is actually some speculation that she wrote to a sanctuary, as she was worried what would happen to Travis if something happened to her, and also, I guess, sort of the realisation that Travis should be of his own kind. Like, every time before bed, he would stare out the window, I suppose, wondering what could be. Regardless, Travis stayed with Sandra at their home. As time began to pass, Travis became even more unpredictable. He lost interest in his various hobbies, such as watching TV or painting. Yeah, you heard that right. Travis apparently loved art. And so, on the 16th of February, 2009, Travis was being particularly boisterous and hyperactive. So Sandra put a Xanax in his morning tea. I'm sure you've heard of Xanax, I'm actually from the UK where Xanax is basically illegal, it's hardly ever prescribed, but it's quite common in other countries. It's a medication used to treat anxiety and belongs to the benzodiazepines family. Sandra hoped it would chill Travis out a bit, now this was not a good decision at all, Xanax is obviously not intended for chimps. As well as this, he was also on medication for a tick-borne illness called Lyme disease, you may have heard of this as well, so these medications could have interfered with each other. A few minutes later, Travis threw one of his temper tantrums. He proceeded to steal Sandra's car keys and leave the house. Now, he didn't go away in the car, but he was running around the property. Having run out of options, Sandra called her friend, Charla Nash, to come to her aid. Now, Charla was very familiar with Travis, they had played together over the years, and she was a good friend of Sandra. She also worked for the Herald's towing company. However, what happened next is truly shocking. So, Charlotte arrived to try and get Travis back inside the house. She was carrying Travis's favourite toy, a 
which was a Tickle Me Elmo toy. Her intention to lure him back into the house with this, however, upon seeing her with his favourite toy, Travis went into complete rage. Now, Charlotte was sporting a new hairstyle, so some people believe Travis didn't recognise her, or maybe it was just the rage that got in the way, but either way, he attacked Charlotte. He pounced on top of her, threw her against the car, and began violently mauling her face. Horrified, Sandra tried to save her friend, hitting him on the head with a shovel, but this did not stop Travis's rage. She'd also taken a kitchen knife out with her and stabbed Travis in his back. She said the chimp looked back at her as if to say, Mom, what did you just do? But within moments, he was back to beating Charlotte. Minutes had passed and at this point, Sandra believed Charlotte to be dead and locked herself in her car, calling the police. Now I'm going to play a small excerpt from the police call, but I think you can find the whole thing online. Dad, the chimp killed my, my friend! What's the problem with your friend? Oh, please! What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Is the monkey still by your friend or can you get close to your friend? He's eating her. Please. God, oh please. Okay, I need you to calm down for me. I know it's hard, okay? I know it's hard. Shoot him, please. I tried stabbing him and, and he's hurt now too. The police initially thought this was a hoax until the he's eating it part. Emergency services arrived but waited for the police before entering the house. As they arrived, Travis, still in his fit of rage, attacked the police car, smashing the mirrors, and attempting to enter the vehicle. He did eventually manage to open the driver's door when Officer Frank Shafari shot him four times with his service pistol. Travis retreated inside, where a trail of his blood led him to his special bed next to his cage. He had gone there to die. By some absolute miracle, Charlotte had survived the horrendous ideal, but her injuries were horrendous. She underwent seven hours of surgery as soon as she got into the hospital, and all the staff members were actually given counselling as these were the worst injuries they had ever seen. She had lost nine fingers, lost her nose, lost her eyes, lost her lips, and mid-face bone structure, as well as receiving significant brain tissue injuries. Doctors also had to remove chimpanzee hair and teeth that had been implanted into her bones and also had to reattach her jaw. They announced on April 7th, 2009 that Nash would be blind for life. Her injuries made her a possible candidate for an experimental face transplant surgery. After initial treatment at Stanford Hospital, Nash was transferred to the Cleveland Clinic. Her family started a trust fund to raise money to pay her unfathomable medical bills and support their daughter. Nash revealed her damaged face to the public for the first time on the Oprah Winfrey show on November 11th, 2009. Sandra died around a year after the incident. She died of a brain aneurysm and she was buried with two urns. One for her late child who had died in a car accident and the second, Travis. This was extremely shocking and it was also a huge news story. If you know anything about chimps in the wild, you'll know how extremely dangerous they can be. Jane Goodall, an expert on chimps, once said, For a long time, I thought chimps were like us, but nicer. And I realised they too have a dark side. A brutal, aggressive dark side. In the documentary Jane, about her experience with chimps in the wild, a tribe of chimps attacked another tribe of chimps, with rocks and killed them all. This was basically part of something called the Gombe Chimpanzee War in Tanzania, which was a four year war, because it can be called nothing else other than a war, between two communities of chimps. During the four year conflict, all males of the Kahama community were killed, effectively disbanding the chimp community. Check out the documentary or have a read about this, maybe I'll cover it in another video very crazy. Chimps in the wild can have extremely warlike, brutal behaviour. Just like us, if you think about it. It's not just killing for survival, it can be killing for rage or killing to become the new alpha. There's many disturbing stories about things that chimps have done. However, they've of course got a lot of amazing qualities, like for example, they will sometimes adopt a baby. Say if the mother has died, they'll take in that baby. They also experience grief in a very similar way to us. I mean, we're just so similar in many, many ways but they should absolutely not be pets, and we should do much more to protect their habitats. It's of course easy to be angry with Sandra and Jerome, 
and they should have known better, and this all could have been avoided. I think they didn't know about the possibilities and the final outcome, and the world still fought chimps with these cute, cuddly creatures. But it's absolutely horrendous what happened to Sharla, and they are ultimately to blame. Now, there was chimps attacks before this, and there's been chimp attacks after it. But laws in a lot of places are stricter on exotic pets of this nature. But as mentioned before, there's still a massive black market for chimps. People continue to play God, kill a chimp's family, rip it away from its home, and destroy its habitat while we're here. And for what? So next time you do see a chimp innocently wearing clothes, just maybe think about this. And listen, the same can be applied to many wild animals. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's been pretty depressing to read and write, but ultimately, it's educational. Please consider subscribing.